All right, so my project's a buffer overflow exploit. So I'm gonna walk through how I created a buffer overflow exploit uh, from scratch. So a uh, buffer overflow is just a vulnerability that happens when uh, you input excess data into a buffer and that it's not designed to handle you know, that much data. So this can lead to crashes and corruption of data. And in my example, um, the execution of malicious code. So for my target, I chose something called Vuln Server on this Windows machine. Uh, it's just a simple, like intentionally vulnerable server for just learning. And it basically just accepts a network connection and allows you to send it some commands, but doesn't actually really do anything. Uh, and here's an example of my Kali machine connecting to a uh, Vuln Server. And you can see that there's a list of commands that it accepts. And my exploit is going to focus on the trun command. Um, and you can see that the trun command accepts one argument, which is just a string of characters. And you can see that I've got it highlighted there. It's just a string of A's. Um, and that is where my buffer overflow string will go. But that's, that's the problem, too, is this trun command will accept any length of characters. So and it doesn't stop it. So the first step was to determine uh, the necessary input link to cause the overflow. So I created this Python fuzzer that did it for me. Um, it just repeatedly sends increasingly longer data to the server using that trun command. And then if you notice here, uh, the buffer uh, variable is just the letter A repeated over and over again. And that will all come into play in here in a second. Um, so while the fuzzer was running against the server, I was on the Windows server with uh, Immunity Debugger open. And I was paying special attention to this value right here called the EIP, or Extended Instruction Pointer. And the, the EIP just tells the CPU which instruction to execute next. And if you notice, I took the screenshot before I started running the fuzzer, and the EIP is just a, a memory address. And then over here, this is after I ran the fuzzer and it crashed the server. And then I can see in the debugger that it overwrote the EIP with the character A or 41 in hex. And then actually, if you look up here in the EAX register, you can see the command that I sent to the server, the trun, and then just a bunch of A's. And then the fuzzer program told me that it crashed around 3,000 bytes. So that was kind of my starter buffer link. So I used that information to do some detective work to figure out like exactly where the EIP was located. And I used a Metasploit tool called uh, Pattern Create and Pattern Offset to generate unique non-repeating pattern of data. And then I put that into the overflow and ran it again. And I looked at the debugger. And then I took the, the, the little snippet of code that wrote into the EIP and I compared this, and then I compared it against this original one, and that helped me deduce that the EIP was exactly 2,003 bytes from the start of my buffer. So that 2,004th byte was the start starting point of where I could start to control the execution of the CPU. So with that information, I could start to create a custom overflow input string. Um, so first, you can see here uh, in this padding variable, I just had the letter A repeated 2,003 times. And that gets us right up to the point where the EIP is. So um, so then I next I had to figure out what am I going to put in that EIP. And the problem is that the EIP only accepts a memory address, not uh, a command directly. So my next task was to find a memory address that contained an assembly instruction that I wanted it to execute. So I went back over onto my Windows machine and used the debugger to actually look through the DLLs on the Windows machine. And I, I chose the, the, the assembly instruction jump ESP, which stands for jump to stack pointer, because when that command runs, it tells the CPU uh, to uh, redirect to the current stack frame, which should contain our buffer overflow code. 
So using the debugger, I kind of underlined it here, if you can see it. Um, I found in the ESSfunk.dll uh, file uh, a memory address that contains that command, which in hex is FFE4. So I just copied that memory address, the 625011AF, and I put it into my script. But also this debugger showed that it didn't have any memory protections on that DLL, so that's why I chose it. Um, so I came back into my, my uh, overflow string, and I put that memory address into the EIP. But when you're writing to memory, you have to do it in uh, what's called little Indian style. So you have to do it backwards. But that just copies it, um, the 625011AF, into the EIP. Um, so whenever the EIP gets to that memory address, it's going to execute that jump ESP command. So I ran the buffer overflow again and with that updated string, and then I was able to verify right here that the EIP was overwritten with that address that I was intending for it to do. Um, so the next step was to have a payload, you know, but before we could put a payload in, you kind of have to put in like um, a safe place for the stack pointer to return to or to land in, because it's kind of hard to predict where exactly the stack pointer will will be in memory in relation to the EIP. So I use something called a NOP sled. Um, the NOP sled, um, it, it'll accommodate any variations in the stack pointer address. Um, and it's just a series of no operation instructions. And in assembly, NOP just tells the CPU to do nothing and, and go to the next uh, memory address and see what the command is there. So basically I created 32 bytes of this no operator uh, command. And so no matter where that ES or that stack pointer might be in memory, it'll land somewhere in this not pointer and just kind of like slide on down to where my payload is. And then uh, 90 and hex is the, the op, op code for uh, the not operator or instruction. So next I needed to create the payload. Um, which I use MSF Venom. Actually, this was the easiest part. I just used MSF Venom and put in the details and then just generated the shell code for me. I didn't have to do anything. So I just copy and pasted this and put it into my, um, my overflow string. So here's my full exploit. It's just a Python script. Um, here's the, the payload um, that will give me a reverse TCP shell. So, um, if you look at the overflow string, it's it's everything that we've done so far. It's just the padding to get us up to the point of the EIP. Then we overwrite the EIP with that address, which points it back into the NOP sled. And then it slides on down and executes our payload. And then I will demonstrate that. So, okay. So over here on my Windows machine, I have a Vuln server already running and waiting for a connection. And then I've got the debugger set up to where it's going to stop right at the point that it overwrites the EIP. And then on my attacker machine, um, can you guys see both sides of that? OK, um, so on, on the Linux machine, I'm going to run netcat to wait for a reverse TCP connection. And then I'm going to go over here and just run my code. So you can see that the debugger stopped. And I successfully overwrote the EIP with that 625011AF inside the ESS Funk DLL. And you can see over here, this is referencing that memory address. So you can see that it has FFE4 or the jump ESP command. So I'm going to step into the, that jump ESP command and let it execute. And then you'll see what happens. And then it pops right back into the current stack frame and right into our NOP sled. And actually, if I scroll up a little bit, you can see this is the rest of my buffer overflow string. So this 41 in hex is the, um, no, crap. OK, I made, a, made, a, made it crap out. Um, uh, but the 41 is the A, so that's 2003 A's, followed by the address that we were writing to the EIP, the 625011AF, and then the NOP sled. So this is what happens with the knock. It just flows right on down 
all the way. So no matter where that memory address may vary a little bit, it'll just slide on down right here to our um, shell code. So the shell code is going to be what's going to give us that reverse TCP connection. You can see right here, BFC5BA, BFC5BA. It's literally just literally that in the code. So I'm going to go ahead and let it run through. And then you can see over here in Cali that it'll do a reverse connection. And just, you know, hit times. OK. So, OK, so I let it run through. And I have a reverse TCP connection to the Windows server. And I should have administrator privileges. Yep. This Vuln server ran as admin. So I have administ administrator privileges and I can I can execute stuff on the Windows machine. So that's pretty much it. Um, as far as mitigations go, um, you absolutely have to have to sanitize all your user inputs. You need to make sure it, there's no escape codes and you need to put a, a limit on the link that they can input. There's also just other security practices that you can do, um, uh, just like compiler options and just secure uh, coding that you can help prevent against this. And then also I didn't have time to do it, but it'd be pretty easy to take that and put it inside a Metasploit module and then you could automate your attack against that server. Uh, 